Well, good evening. It's good to be here this evening in the Salem Mennonite Church. And a lot of times when I go out and talk about open hands, there aren't very many people in the congregation that I know. But uh, I know of at least uh, two couples that are here because they knew me before and they, this isn't their church and they came here just because they wanted to hear me speak and I feel honored about that. And there's also a few people that uh, are either working with open hands or have worked with open hands in the past who are here this evening. So I feel like that there are a lot of people that I know. And uh, when I was looking at the, uh, oh, I have a Christian light uh, church directory for Mennonite churches, and I found out that uh, there's a minister in your church that I met probably 20 years ago for the first time. I think I met him once. Uh, Terrell. Is Terrell here this evening? Right there. Remember when we met? That's right. It's when I was talking with you about a mission down in Mexico with Daniel Friesen. Okay. The, uh, well, I didn't remember your face, but I remembered your name. <laughs> Okay, well, it's good to be here, and somebody already told me that uh, they know that my wife is an author. My wife, Dorcas, is the one who writes, and uh, which means that some of you probably think that you know me pretty well because you've uh, read about me and what she wrote. But you might end up, after the end of the service, being like the man who shook my hand after I had spoken at Sharon Bethel Beachy Church in Kelowna, Iowa. After the service, he came back and he said, I thought I knew you because my wife has read your wife's books to me. But I realized I didn't really know you. So I might be a little bit different than what you uh, get from the books. Anyway. And so many of you probably also know that I had a bad fall three and a half years ago. I could talk for about uh, 20 minutes on all that I feel like God has done for that. I want to thank you for your prayers, for those of you who prayed. I am just about fully recovered from that. My left arm to begin with was fully paralyzed. It is now partially usable. You will probably notice that I do I don't, it doesn't act quite like normal. If I work real hard, I can reach up and touch my shoulder. It is limber enough that I can lift it up, but as soon as I let go of it, it falls because my shoulder muscles still are not working at all. But it is, it is, well, there's two reasons why I'm here this evening. I'm here this evening, one of the reasons is because I felt. If I would have never fallen, I would have never become a part of Open Hands, and so I would never be here for uh, this because I became a part of Open Hands about seven months after I fell. I, was, uh, I got a newsletter in the mail one day, and it was from Open Hands. And I read the newsletter, and I knew the man who had started Open Hands, and I thought, I'm not doing anything. Maybe I can uh, do something for open hands. So I sent Merle Burkholder an email and uh, seeing if I could volunteer for open hands and he responded back by saying, no, we don't have anything that you can volunteer for, but we would be glad to hire you. And so I got hired to be the PR representative for the Western United States, which is west of the Mississippi River. You say, well, we're east of the Mississippi River. That is correct. But uh, our PR person for the eastern United States lives in Pennsylvania. He doesn't like to get much further west than Ohio. So uh, northern Indiana, north, northern Indiana for his, for, from his standpoint is west of the Mississippi River. So that's why I'm here. Somebody mentioned that you needed to be get well settled in your seats. The, um, I was, well, Another reason I'm here is because of the Haiti Benefit Auction. I always attend the uh, Arthur Illinois Haiti Benefit Auction to represent open hands there. And uh, while I was there at the end of October, I, uh, there was somebody from your congregation there and we got to talking and uh, the, well, I, I met a few people from, that knew people from the congregation here 
And uh, I'm not sure how it came to that, but I knew I was coming here and I didn't have anywhere to speak this evening. And so I said to him, uh, uh, how about if I would come to your church? And he said, yes, why don't you? And so he figured it out. So I'm here. But um, the, now I forget what else I was going to say about uh, being at Arthur, Illinois, but I'll just keep going. What I'd like to talk about this evening is the poor, the people who are materially poor, and how we think about them and how we can help them. I don't know what you think about when you think about the poor. In the last two and a half years that I've been with Open Hands, my thinking about the poor has changed quite a bit. Open Hands works with the poor and tries to follow God's command to help the poor. Open Hands reaches out to individuals in poverty around the world, not with humanitarian aid, such as food and housing, but by training local Christians to facilitate local community groups who learn to save money together. These people with few resources realize that they have the ability to save, and as they began to overcome their dependency, and they can regain their dignity. In 13 countries around the world, Open Hand Savings Groups are currently helping more than 32,000 individuals understand that they have God-given resources that they can use to survive without being dependent on another culture. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15, it's in this chapter is where we got our name. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8 and 10 and 11. Verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thy heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open wide thine hand, open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need, in which he wanteth. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open, wide, open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Twice we are told in these verses that we are to open our hands wide. Once we are told that we are not to shut our hands. Verse 10 tells us that we are to give to the poor. And verse 11 says that we will always have the poor with us. You know what that means? That means you will never be able to not follow this command. There will always be poor people that you are to open your hand to. Not, no matter how hard and how much you work at opening your hands to the poor. They will always be there. In our culture, opening our hands means to give money or to give material things. When I, if I would ask you, how do you open your hands to the poor, you'd probably say, oh, by... Uh, by uh, Helping with uh, send food boxes to Haiti or to Romania or uh, Liberia or to uh, give money so that the poor people in India can be fed or things like that. And that's kind of what we think of. Open our hands, give money, give things. And as Anabaptists, we work really hard at that. I have no complaints about how much we as Anabaptists 
do to try to help the poor. But as I look at the poor we try to help, I'm not convinced that we're always doing it in the right way. All we need to think about is how much money Anabaptists have given to Haiti and how much good has actually come out of it. I think when God told us that we are to open our hands to the poor, he didn't mean all you're supposed to do is to give them material things and money and to give them material things and money for the rest of their life and the rest of your life. You say, why don't you think he means that? Because of the effect that I have seen. I could tell you story after story about the dependency that has been created in Haiti and in Kenya and in India and in many of these other poor countries because we have gone in usually for a disaster where they need help like a hurricane or an earthquake or a tsunami or something like that and we have given them help and then we just keep giving them and giving them and giving them. When I started thinking about dependency, dependency became kind of a bad word to me because of all the, of what it does to the poor people. And then I got to thinking, no, when my son, oldest son Matthew was six years old, he was dependent on me. And that's the way God designed it. And I got a real thrill out of having him dependent on me. And me being the one who would earn the money so we could buy him food and give him shelter and buy him clothes, and that was something that was really good for me, that I had the opportunity to do that. Matthew is now 37 years old. He's an engineer with NASA in uh, Houston, Texas. He is not dependent on me one bit. He's earning more money than I am. He doesn't need to be dependent on me. If he was dependent on me, whose fault would that be? His or mine? Mine. Because I would have failed to teach him that as an adult, it's his responsibility to make decisions and it's his responsibility to live with the good consequences or the bad consequences of his decisions. Whose fault is the dependency that we have created in Haiti? It's not those poor people's fault. It's our fault. Whose fault is the dependency that the poor people in the United States have on welfare. It's not the poor people's fault. It's the government's fault. Because the easiest way to try to solve material poverty is to give somebody things and money. If I were to ask you to describe poverty and poorness, you would probably, and what it is, to kind of describe that in one word, you would probably say things like homelessness, uh, hunger, things like that. The lack of material things. <clears throat> Do you know how poor people describe poverty? They use words like shame, inferiority, powerlessness, humiliation, fear, hopelessness, depression, social isolation, and voicelessness. <clears throat> when I give a poor person $100, how much of their shame and inferiority and powerlessness and humiliation does that help with? These words that I just listed, do you know what they are actually describing? 
they are describing a person who feels of no value. And that's how the poor people feel. You know how the poor people are treated by most people? They're taken advantage of. Nobody wants to help them. They are considered to be the scum of the earth, and people treat them like they are the scum of the earth. And it doesn't take them long to wonder whether or not they are the scum of the earth. They don't feel like they have any value and that they're worthless. When we, all we do to help the poor people is go give them things and money, the first few times we, they, we do it, they'll probably feel like that we're doing it because we love them and because we're trying to help them. It doesn't take long until they begin to feel entitled to it because I keep doing it, and it reinforces in their minds that they are of no value because they can't do anything themselves. Because that's what everybody tells them, and that's how they feel, and when we continuously give, that re reaffirms in their mind their uselessness and they're having a no value. I'd like you to take your Bibles again and turn to John chapter 4. And I'm going to give you about a five minute sermon about Jesus and see how we can follow his example about how he treats people. In John chapter 4, starting with verse 3, And he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee, this he is Jesus. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman to, of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto her, How is it that thou being a Jew, Ask us drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. About three months ago, I was over in Nepal, and I was speaking to some facilitators there, and I was using this passage, not for this particular reason, but I was using this passage to do some teaching for them, And verse 9 just really stuck out to me. And I got to thinking about that. And then I got to thinking, how in the world did Jesus do what he did with just four words? Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. The Samaritan woman, who was a Samaritan, who was despised by the Jews because she was a Samaritan woman, this woman also was a very immoral woman. She had, had, she had been probably divorced and remarried for four times and was living with somebody who was not her husband. Jesus said four words to her. Give me to drink. I wish I could have heard how he said it. Her response was, how is it that you being a Jew... Ask of me a drink, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. I can't tell from this whether she actually said that part or not. She was basically saying, Jesus, why are you treating me as a woman who has value? Who can do something for you? Who is worthwhile? You say, why do you think that's what she said? I don't have time this evening. You follow their conversation down. They talked about living water. They talked about how to worship God. This was with a Samaritan who was of a totally different religion, who was 
an evil, wicked woman, Jesus, as he talked with her, she perceived that he felt like she had no value, which was different from every other Jew that she had ever talked to. What was the result of Jesus treating her like she had value? The result was that this Samaritan woman and her friends and many other Samaritans came to know Jesus as their personal savior and came to understand that they had opportunity for eternal life. That's what the rest of the chapter tells us. Why? Because Jesus treated them, her, as a woman who had value. When I started thinking about that, my mind went back to considering how I have treated people, particularly poor people, particularly people who aren't making good decisions. You know, poor people are usually poor because they made bad decisions. We tend to treat people about whether they have value by whether or not they're making good decisions. And if they make good decisions, then they have value. But if they're making bad decisions, they don't have any value. As a father, I was tempted at times to treat my children like, I will love you more if you make the right decisions. But that's a very human way to speak. That's not the way to think. That's not the way God thinks. God loved you and me before we made any decision to do what was right. The Samaritan woman who had made no decision, Jesus treated her like she was a person of value. Too often, the way we treat the poor, the way we respond to the poor, the way we react to the poor, is reinforcing in their minds that they have no value. Now, why is that important? The reason that is important is because a person who feels like they have no value can't understand the love of God. And the reason they can't understand the love of God is because they can't imagine that God would love them if they have no value. And if they begin to understand that they have some value, particularly if they're shown that they have some value by people who claim to be serving God, then they can become, begin to understand that God loves them. And... When we go to places like Haiti and consistently over a long period of time hand out things to them and develop a dependency which makes it so that we can control them, then it reinforces in their mind that they are of no value. When I was in Nepal, Two months ago, that was right about two months ago, we went to several different savings groups and we asked the people in the savings groups, uh, what have the savings groups done for you? In two different savings groups, someone got up and said, as it was translated to us, that it has made me feel more confident. Both times it was translated that way, but it was the same translator. So uh, what that was saying to me was, each of these two people was saying, being in the savings group helped me feel like I had value. That I was, had something that I could do. There is... As I understand it, I haven't been in a whole lot of savings groups. I have visited some. I have talked to people who have been involved. But as people go through the savings groups and realize that they can save money, it makes them realize that they have value. And they can actually 
do something. You know, saving money is difficult. It is extremely difficult. And saving money de does not depend on how much money you're earning, how easy it is. It isn't any easier for those of you who earn $50,000 a year to save money than it is for somebody who earns $100 a year. And people have said, why in the world do you try to go to Haiti and uh, try to save money there? Because, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get to that one a little bit. The, uh, I'm not following my notes very good, and that's going to mean it's going to take me longer to get done with everything. But Jesus, when he was working with the Samaritan woman, he treated her as a person that has value. And we need to be able to learn how we can treat the poor people as people that have value. It's difficult at times. It can be extremely difficult, and I'm not saying that it's easy. And we have all kinds of excuses on why we don't need to. But I am convinced that if we do, we will have more of the successes that Jesus had. In 1989, Merle Burkholder and his wife Edith and their three children lived in Dryden, Ontario, Canada. Their family decided to move to Canada for 18 months to uh, do some ministry down there so that Merle could assist a Haitian pastor with his church in Haiti. They went down with the SLM mission, and I believe that, uh, I think Wawa was just uh, not very old at the time. He can maybe tell us about that. He's going to come up here a little bit and talk a little bit about, uh, because uh, he, know, he knows probably more about that than I do. Anyway, but he was there for, they were there for 18 months, and Merle tells me that when he went back to Canada, he was very burdened for how the poor people in Haiti were being treated, or basically how the missionaries were trying to help the poverty in Haiti, but he didn't know what to do. Fifteen years later, in 2005, Merle Burkholder was one of the original board members of Anabaptist Financial. And in one of their board meetings, not real long after they started, he told the rest of the board, he said, we're doing banking and finances for the rich Anabaptists in North America. What are we going to do for the poor, poor Anabaptists around the world? And he was thinking of the Anabaptists in Haiti. And they looked at him and they said, we don't have a clue. But if you want to try to figure it out, you can. So Merle got a steering committee together and took about four years. And in 2009, we started our, um, we started savings groups in Haiti. When I was in Kenya two years ago, I talked with I was there for a facilitator training and I talked to a number of the facilitators and at every, every facilitator that I talked to about my first question was, in your savings groups, do you have people that come to Christ? And every one of them answered the question with yes, with smiles on their faces. One of them told me, he said, uh, I helped this group start a savings group. Six months later, they came to me and they said, we don't have a church in our area. Would you come and help us start a church? So he went and helped them start a church. Now, when you think of us helping people start savings groups, there may be some of you who have, uh, have wondered uh, is that much different than the social gospel? I've had some people accuse me of uh, what we're doing is just the social gospel. Well, my answer to that is it is not the social gospel because we have plenty of people coming to Christ. Our goal is not evangelism. 
I think God has more commands in the Bible that we are to help the poor than that we are to evangelize. That doesn't mean we are to evangelize. That does mean that we are to try to help the poor in ways that don't create dependency. And as we help the poor, we need to be wise in how we do it. And I think that the wisest way to help the poor is with savings groups that I'll be telling you about a little bit later. Oh, when I was in Arthur, Illinois at the Haiti Benefit Auction, at the, how many of you have ever been to a Haiti Benefit Auction? Okay, most of you. You know there's that one section where they have all the missions come to that are uh, being funded by the auction and the people who attend the auction are supposed to come visit the, the mission booths to uh, find out what the missions are doing, but it's way more fun to buy things at the auction than it is to go talk to these uh, missionaries back in the booth. So uh, not too many of those people come. So those of us in the booth, we spend a little bit of time talking among ourselves. And so uh, I went over to the SLM booth and I was talking to them and I found out that uh, I didn't realize this before, but I found out that it was their area where we had started our savings groups. And the man there said, savings groups have done wonderful things for the Haitian people. And then he told me this story that I'm going to tell in every church that I ever talk about open hands. He said, in their mission area, before the savings groups came in, whenever there was an economic problem of some sort or the people had needs, they would come to the missionaries on a regular basis asking for money, sometimes demanding money, basically acting like they were very entitled because these missionaries had given and given and given. And of course, they are giving and giving and giving because they love the Haitians. So if the Haitians have a need to show their love, they have to keep giving and giving and giving. And it was really bad, and they knew it was bad. In the last year or so in Haiti, inflation has been over 35%. At some point recently, in Haiti, some of the Haitian Christians have gone to the SLM missionaries with a total different attitude when they, than what they had had before. They said something like this, inflation is over 35%, our people are having real trouble buying food and, uh, and being able to do what they need to do if you want to help us you can. It makes me cry almost every time I hear tell that story. Because that is evidence that the savings group took those people from a terrible dependency to a place where they could go to the missionaries with dignity and they could let them know of their problem without having, facing the whole thing of dependency. I don't think we realize how horrible dependency is and how horrible the feeling of I am no value, there is nothing I can do. I don't think we understand how hard that is. And Merle tells me one time, he was in Haiti, he was at a savings group visiting it, and within the, uh, within the savings group there was one person who had, uh, had a relative that had died. And as I understand it, the, uh, in Haiti, when you have a death, it is very important that you have a huge funeral because the bigger the funeral, the more people that come to the funeral, the more honor the dead person gets. So they like to have real big funerals. And a uh, big funeral costs money because if you invite somebody to your funeral, you have to feed them. And it takes money to, uh, to uh, buy the food. 
And worse than not having very many people at your funeral is to have lots of people at your funeral and not have enough food for everybody. And so this one person who was part of the family had a certain amount of money that they were supposed to contribute towards the funeral. She didn't have that amount of money. And so the savings groups decided that among themselves, they, wouldn't ta they couldn't take money out of their savings, but just among themselves, they would try to give her her part. Merle was sitting there while they were having that discussion. Merle says, I thought, I have all the money they need in my pocket. I should just give it to them. He said three times, he almost got out of his seat and went and put that money where they were collecting the money for that funeral. But every time he thought, no, these are adults. This is their problem. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to create a dependency. So he did not. Several days later, he saw a Haitian leader and he told him the story, and he asked this Haitian leader, he said, uh, should I have put that money in there? And the Haitian leader said, absolutely not. If you would have, you would have destroyed everything that you have taught us in the last five or six years. And you never get to the place where you have to be careful about not creating dependency. Okay. Let me move along. The, got a PowerPoint to show you, and the, uh, the, there is a video on here, and I want to thank the sound person who has tried really, really hard to figure out a way how we can uh, play the audio of this uh, video. So you might have to listen really, really closely because I'm going to be using this handheld mic and I'm going to try to hold it close to the speaker on my, uh, on my computer because we weren't able to make the, put it on to your other speaker system. So um, you follow along and watch the video, see if I can push the... <laughs> Open Hands is an organization that works to eliminate poverty or at least reduce poverty. We believe that poverty is caused by broken relationships of man with God, man with each other, man with self, and man with the rest of creation. And so Jesus reconciles all those relationships. That reduces poverty when those relationships are healed. We do that by helping people save their own money and uh, form savings groups. We also partner with existing savings groups to help people come together in community and support each other. Also, Open Hands has facilitators that we hire who go into the savings groups and teach the group, help the groups develop, and teach small business and so forth. I think as a field coordinator, I'm in charge of making sure that uh, the volunteers are doing their work because we have some people that are working under me and I normally visit them in their groups meeting so that I may know what they're doing and if they are teaching and if they are doing things according to the expectation of the profile training. My desire is to see people lovingly serving together and reconciled in their relationships and rising up from the dark corridors of poverty into the brighter light of better opportunities as they search out of their savings rooms. Wherein previously they were talking of businesses that could be worth, say, a hundred dollars. I have seen those who are becoming landlords collecting rent worth hundreds now of dollars. People are coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ. If they're not saved, then we hope they become saved. And a lot of times missionaries struggle because they're doing pastoral work and they get a lot of financial requests and it's just challenging because they get a lot of financial pressure and it just gets complicated and then they make loans and then that can make difficulties in relationships between the pastor and the, and the people. So. 
our hope is that we can come in as an arm of the missions and the churches. And we've been hearing from missionaries and from pastors that our programs are lessening that stress. Should you be an American and you've been involved in uh, giving towards the Open Hands program, I am gladly telling you your support is not in vain. Every single dollar you are giving, I have seen that single dollar provide teaching to multitudes of people. You are helping people see the brighter side of life, see that it is possible that you can save and start a business or grow your property down the line. Don't be wary. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about the history of uh, Open Hands. We started in 2009 in Haiti, and one of the first facilitators that we trained was Wawa, who's a part of your congregation here. So I think we're going to have him come up and uh, talk for five or ten minutes. I'm not sure what all he's going to say, but we'll give him an opportunity right now. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and listening to us. Yeah, Open Hands started in Haiti in 2009. As Paul mentioned, I was one of the first facilitators. So yeah, we're trying to, to start the program. It was really difficult to start that program in Haiti. Like we say, yeah, open hands, we don't hand out, we don't give stuff out. So when, yeah, when we started that program and the organization was called Anabaptist Foundation, this is how we started. Then we did it through Hope International from Pennsylvania because we didn't have much experience in that doing saving groups. And Hope International is an organization that do that, they, they did it for a while so we use them, but they didn't have experience in Haiti or Dominican Republic, so they use another one from Dominican Republic, Esperanza. So at that time, three, organ three organizations worked, worked together. And finally, so we, yeah, finally we came on, a, and we went on our own, and we called it Open Hands. So we, work in, we started in Haiti in 2009. So that was new for the people. A mission goes to Haiti, you don't give stuff out. You don't give anything out. And we try to contact churches and say, yeah, we, have, we are a mission and we want to help your church. So how do you want to do that? Yeah, by creating saving groups. So what will you give to us? That is, yeah, that is, and all that was the question. So. We had so many times when we went to, the, to talk to the ministers, so what will you give to the groups? We said, nothing, so we'll provide teaching. And for a while, it didn't, it didn't really work. Sometimes they say, no, we're not interested. And we went to other churches, but just one church where uh, my dad is a pastor, so that church and Mel was there, and so, yeah, they know me, I go to that church, and they know, yeah, Mel, and so they said, yeah, we should try it. And we tried, and that was, I would say, one of the most effective program in Haiti. It brings a lot of changes. And one thing, a story I can tell you, that church was built in 90, in, in 91 by SLM. They built that church. And so one time, 
There was a missionary in Haiti, but they live in port au in, in the capital. Once a month or twice a month, they go to the south. That means kayak and further, we call it lacolin. And they, they wanted to work on benches. And the missionary, he told the single guy, don't say anything to my dad, to Pastor Paul. Don't say anything to Paul. What you're going to do to the other church. If you say that, he will ask for something too. This is what he said. And a couple of years later, with that program, we've saving groups because we, we started in that church. And the people, the, by teaching them, and they started to understand what does that mean working together? What does that mean building trust? And what does that mean uh, the key, this is what we, we teach them, key relationships. And the church was smaller. They wanted to add something. They got enough money. The church had enough money to do it on their own. And when the mission find, found out they were building, they were adding on the church. And first, they said, don't say anything to Paul because he will ask for some. And now they came and said, you're adding on the church, you didn't say anything to the mission. What can we do to help? Now they offer the help. So why, because of the saving groups, all the, almost most of the members of that church, they were part of the saving groups, they can save money and they know how to, how to share and they realize it's the church and they get, now they became more responsible to help and they did that. Yes, so the teachings, the teaching is a good key in the saving groups. As the Bible said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that is exactly true, when you know the truth. Sometimes we have something, we have a potential, and we don't use it. Sometimes if you don't use it, you lose it. They have it. And it's, it's not because of the countries. It's not because of colors. We all have the same potential to do stuff. But when I was in Haiti, the last time I was in Haiti, I had a conference, and we said the subject was unlock your potential. Sometimes it is luck. We don't use it. But if we start using it, so that would expand. So don't hand out. We don't give stuff out. Like the Sunday school lesson this morning, like they asked that question, can something good come out of it? Like, and the answer was come and see. And we can say that too, come and try. This is what some people say. So what, what can we get from a saving group? Try it. And sometimes they try it. Usually the first cycle, it's something we call it cycle. So sometimes they do it for six months. The, the, the first time when they start saving, we say, don't do it too long. They do it for six months. And sometime in that, period in that cycle, they don't save too much because they are a little bit scared. It's a little bit scary. They don't know what will happen. What will happen, they just do it for a little bit and they try it. And the next time, oh yeah, it works. More people come and they save more, yeah, and they save more money. Yeah, they say, oh yeah, it works good and I will save more next time. Yeah, so yeah, I give the story about the church in Haiti. Yeah, about the church that was built in 91. And because of the saving groups, so they were able to, to, uh, yeah, to add in the church without asking the mission. So why a saving group is so important in poor countries like? Yeah, why a saving group is so important in countries like Haiti? And like here, you have banks. You can yeah, save your money in banks. And 
yeah, it's okay. Even when you work, yep, you, yep, they can just pay you through, through the bank. It's not a problem. But in Haiti, that was, yeah, that was something very important. Interesting, when I moved here in 2011, and yeah, there was something, I saw something on TV, credit card. For some reason, I wanted to have a credit card in Haiti. So I went to the bank, and I said, how do I get a credit card? They said, okay, they gave me a big list, about 15 points. You should own a house, you should have a big job, you should show how you pay electricity, how you pay water, a lot of stuff, and you should have three more people to sign for you so you can have a credit card. And when I moved up here, so my wife we went to the bank to add me on her account. The first thing, Walkers, do you want a credit card? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in Haiti, the bank requires too much for the people to open, to have a saving account, to have an account. Yeah. And also, the distance between where they live to the bank, it's too far. And sometimes you can, they want to save just a little bit, they have just a little bit to save, and they, they have to pay more for transportation to go to the bank to save that money. It doesn't work. And also, it's a, it's a big thing. Sometimes now, you can go to the bank and spend three, four hours in, in line to get in, in Haiti right now. It doesn't work. And so a saving group, you can just work to the, to the saving groups. It works really good and they like it, and you can small amount. This is what we call portion, portion, like 25 goods. This is what we have in Haiti, goods. 25 goods, 50 goods, and you can save that, you can save that amount. And so, at the end of this year, like December, like the December, at the end of the, this year, we wanted to have a total of 1,000 groups. But because of the situation in Haiti, we didn't reach that. Right now, we have 600 and, about 680 groups. And we have 15 facilitators, facilitators and three field coordinators and 45 AVFs and three VFs. And yes, and the exciting news is, so now we are working in the south and because of, of how we, we, we work in Haiti and also of fun, uh, because of how much fun uh, we have, so we can expand, expand the program and we'd like to do it in the north of Haiti. Hopefully, early this next year, I will go to Haiti for a training, and we'd like yeah, to start in the north of Haiti. So when I was in Haiti three months ago, so we went to the north to, to experience the program, to meet with the leaders. So yeah, they are so excited, they say yes. So we had two meetings there. First meeting, we had 36 people. I mean, church leaders, and the next one we have 11 church leaders that say, yes, we want you to come yeah, yeah, to start the program there because they say, we can trust you guys because you say you don't want, at the beginning we say we don't give stuff away, we don't give stuff out. But we want to thank you as a congregation for praying, for sharing with the program, and yes, a program like that in a third world country is very helpful. That can change people's mentality. When you think you are poor, you think because it's a lack of resources or of a lack of material things, but sometimes it can be in your mind. Some, some people, there is an expression that say, I can do anything because I'm so low, I'm so small, I can do anything. But if you have that in your mind, and that can spread, I would say, in all oh, your body would say, yes, I can do anything, I can do anything. But by teaching, you can realize you can do something. But thank you so much for praying and sharing for the program.
And also, thanks to Paul for letting me talk, and I know, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. So now you know all about Haiti. That was in 2009. In 2011, we started in uh, India. The, oh, I should go back to Haiti. I believe in Haiti now, 14 years later, we are getting close to 700 groups when we started out with just one or two. And we are getting close, I believe, to uh, 1,900 or 19,000 members. And uh, that's where we are the biggest. We started in India in 2011. India has kind of been up and down. One of the sections where we were doing very well there, we had, when we started in Haiti and we started in India, Hope International was also helping us. And uh, Hope International has taken over the one thing that we were doing in India. And the other place where we were, that one kind of got big and then it kind of collapsed because it got big too fast. And we are kind of in the process of trying to resurrect that one now. In 2013, we uh, started in East Africa, Kenya, which uh, now we are in Uganda and Ethiopia and Tanzania, which are around Kenya. And uh, we have I think around 650 groups in, in Kenya, but they don't have, their groups aren't quite as big, so they don't have quite as many people in them. And the, in 2014, we started as a part of Anabaptist Financial. If I had about 10 minutes, I could tell you the story of how we switched from Anabaptist Financial to be our own organization, we are separate. In 2014 is when we separated, not because we got mad at them and had a big fight, but because it was just better for them and for us if we were two separate organizations. That happened in 2014. In 2015, we started in Central America. We now have, um, get my figures here, we have 41 groups in Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador. In 2017, we started in Nepal, where we now have 103 groups. In 2021, we started in Thailand, where we now have 57 groups. And in 2022, we started in Colombia, and uh, where we have just six groups. That hasn't taken off real fast. Let's talk a little bit about who we are as an organization. You know, all organizations are supposed to have a mission and a vision and a purpose, and uh, now they tell organizations you're supposed to have those all written down. Years ago, it was kind of like you had them in the backs of your minds, but now you're supposed to have them all written down to make sure you do things right in your business. But uh, a vision, I always, Move this one, two, no, I don't. A vision statement is one that describes what we want to achieve in the long run. For open hands, it is to see the financially vulnerable, stabilized and growing, standing with each other in Christian community. We want to take poor people and get them away from their poverty mentality and help them to be able to grow understand Christianity, understand Christ and salvation, and become a part of a Christian community. That is what our vision is. A mission is our summary of our aims and values. The mission of Open Hands is to uh, develop community and reduce poverty through Christ-centered savings groups and training programs. Right now, all we are doing is savings groups. That's it. We are not doing microfinance. We are not doing macrofinance. We are not doing uh, church planting. We are doing savings groups. And that is all that we are doing. Within the savings groups, we are doing some evangelization, and people are coming to Christ, and people are growing and having broken relationships restored. But uh, our mission now is to work with savings groups. 
Oops, I'm hitting the wrong button. My computer's too far over there and I can't talk to the phone while I hit the button. Anyway, purpose. Our purpose is to reduce poverty and to build dignity by helping the poor people overcome their poverty mentality. As savings group members are saving, they learn about God and they have many of their broken relationships restored. They tell me that poverty is caused by broken relationships with God, broken relationships with other people, broken relationships with yourself, and broken relationships with God's creation. From my observation, in savings groups, they do a good job of restoring their broken relationship with God. They have a lot of community within their savings groups, which helps restore their broken relationships with other people. And when the people in savings groups go from being the dependent people who are always demanding to the people with dignity who are telling what their problems are, it's very evident that they are restoring their relationships with themselves. And just the fact that they can save money is restoring their, crea their relationship with uh, creation. Let me tell you a couple things about Haiti. In 2021 and 2022, in each of those two years, in our savings groups, they saved over a million dollars. And as they saved over a million dollars, they began to realize that they were people that were capable of doing something and uh, were capable of, uh, yeah. And it's just amazing to me what savings works do, savings groups do for people. Let me talk just a little bit about how the savings groups work. We go into a place, we train people, we call them facilitators. The facilitator's job, and in different countries they have a little bit different name, but I'm going to call all of them facilitators. That way Wawa won't get too mad at me because he knows the exact names and I don't. But uh, the facilitators are um, the ones who facilitate the groups. Their job is to be at every group meeting and to make sure that things are going well in the group and to do some teaching in the meeting. The facilitator is not an actual part of the group. Each group works as their own individual entity. They solve their own problems. They decide as a group what they are going to do. And for these poor people, they have never in their life had the opportunity as an adult to make decisions about their finances because we have treated them like children that we have made dependent and we just keep giving them things. When they get the opportunity to make decisions about their own money, it makes them realize that they are a capable adult. And it just does wonderful things for them. One of the first things a group does is they choose a leader, they choose a secretary, and they choose a treasurer. The leader's job is to lead each meeting. The leader's job is not to be the boss of the group. Because too often we have make our leaders into bosses. Leaders are the ones that are supposed to kind of direct everybody in the way to go, but it is the group that should be making the decision. And so within each group, no matter how poor the person is, they have an opportunity to make decisions. And the secretary's job is to keep track of how much money each person gives because at each meeting, when they come, they each one bring some money and put it into savings. They give their money to the treasurer, the secretary writes the amount down and records it, and uh, the secretary also records them as being present. And then they always do this at the beginning of their meetings. You know, every different country is different. And there's been some interesting th stories that I've heard about Haiti. There was one group in Haiti that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It got to where it had over 100 people in the meeting. 
I mean, in the group. We kept telling them it would be wise if you would split your group up into a couple groups. Because once you get more than 20 or 30 people in your group, it just takes so much time for everybody to turn their money in. Because they have to do it one at a time, because there's only one secretary and there's only one treasurer. And uh, so at the beginning of the meeting, or whenever in the meeting they did it, they would come up one at a time, hand their money in, get it recorded, then the next guy would come up. I don't know because I've never been there, but I would guess it cost, it, it took at least 30 seconds and maybe a minute per person. Okay? From being from North America, I have no interest in going to a savings group meeting where I'm going to have to wait the first 100 minutes to, uh, till, till everybody gets their money handed in. But you want to know something? It doesn't make any difference what I as a North American think. If they want to do that, that's their privilege. It's their group. And if that's the way they want to do it, who am I to say, you need to split up so you have five groups and you have 20 people in each group so that it only takes 20 minutes for you to hand your money in. And to me, one of the primary goodness of the savings groups is that it's theirs. Those of you who have been involved in missions know how difficult it has been for us when we go into different places for us to make the church belong to the local people. They always look at it as the North Americans. They always treat the money in that church as the North Americans' money because that's whose it is. Do you know how they treat the money in their savings groups? I don't know if you look closely at those videos, at that video that you saw. Most of those where the, where the uh, people were singing and most of, the, uh, most of the video was taken in one savings group. It was the last meeting of the cycle. There were piles of money sitting there. Each pile of money was the amount of savings that was going to go back to each individual person. That's how much money they had saved during their individual cycle. Every time when they called somebody up to get their money, they must have counted that money five times. The facilitator counted it, the leader counted it, the secretary counted it, the treasurer counted it, and the money person who was getting it counted it. And I was there watching all that, and it took a lot of time. There wasn't 100 people in the group, fortunately. But... Um, the, they wanted to make sure for positive that everybody got the right amount of money. And this was in Kenya, where 15 years before I had been in Kenya for three months and found out all of the problems that they had with the Kenyan pastors and the mission money. And it's because it was their own. And these savings groups become their own. Each time they have a meeting, okay, when they form a group, they decide how long their cycle is going to be. A cycle is anywhere from six months to a year. They decide how long it's going to be. They save their money. At the end of the cycle is when they get all their money back. Some of the groups, when they get a little bit of money in the, in the a lump sum of money, they will take that money and they will start handing it out as loans to people within the group. Those loans are very short-term loans. And when they, when they give out a loan, well, basically, as I understand it, and they might do it different in Haiti, I feel a little bit, uh, when, I, when, when, when I'm talking with both uh, Bruce here and uh, Wawa here, I'm afraid I'm going to make a little mistake and say something a little bit wrong. But if I say something wrong, you tell me afterwards, because uh, as I understand it, they will, uh, at the meeting, when they accumulate a little bit of money in their group savings, they will, the facilitator will tell them, okay, if, at our next meeting, if you have some loans, you can uh, come with a request for loans. And uh, these loans would be a short-term loan. And so the next meeting comes and they come with their requests. Say they have $100 in their savings. And the facilitator will tell them, okay, 
you know, when you have some money, you don't want to loan it all out, so you need to decide how much of this you're willing to loan out. And so they'll usually decide somewhere around 50%. So that means if they had $100, that they had uh, now $50, $50 that they were able to, to, to loan out. But say uh, in your group you had requests for, uh, for loans that were $90. Now what are you going to do? You only have $50 to loan out, and you have requests for $90. So we don't tell them what to do. We let them figure it out. So uh, the group will decide. They'll look over the loans and they might decide, well, this is a little bit of a frivolous loan, so we're not going to give this one. But the, all the rest of them look like good loans, so now we have $75 a loan that people want and we only have $50 to hand out. Why don't we give everybody two-thirds of what they're asking for so everybody can get a loan and everybody can get a percentage of what they're asking for and we'll have that much money that we can loan out. And so, whatever they decide is what they do. But then they go one more step. They decide these loans have to be repaid before the end of the cycle because the money has to be back in by the end of the cycle so we can give it out to everybody who is saving it. And so they say, okay, we better charge interest. And we better make it a high interest so that everybody repays it. And I am told that the routine interest is 10% a month. And you say, usury. That's what I thought too at first. But no, usury is when a rich man charges a poor man high interest so the rich man can get richer and the poor man get poorer. These are people who are charging themselves to inspire them to pay it back. That interest that they pay goes into the group's savings. At the end of the cycle, when the savings gets all handed out, then the interest money that was earned gets divided out among the people in the group. When they hand out loans, the loans have nothing to do with what you have in savings already. The loan is whether or not the group will loan you that amount of money from within from within. So if you haven't borrowed very much, or if you haven't saved very much, you could still possibly get a bigger loan. One other thing that I found very exciting about these savings groups, they tell me that about half of the groups in Haiti and Kenya have what they call a benevolence fund. The benevolence fund is completely separate from their savings. And this is not something that we tell them they are supposed to start, but they just kind of started on their own. The benevolence fund, you bring your money and you put it into the savings. If you have some other money that you want to put into the benevolence fund, you can, but that's completely separate from the savings fund. And whatever is in the benevolence fund, whenever anybody within the group or even sometimes people outside the group have an emergency and they need some money, the group will decide whether or not to give out of the benevolence fund they will never give anything out of the benevolence fund so you can make your business better, but they might give something out of the benevolence fund if your child had a sickness and you had to buy some medicine and you didn't have any, any money from that for that. But the benevolence fund never has to be paid back. And that is something that they have developed. And it's just so exciting to me because we've been accused of, with the savings groups, oh, you're just trying to... Uh, Get them to be so money conscious that uh, you know you're trying to get to them to be to where they're they're rich like North Americans. No, these these people are going to stay poor the rest of their life. They're not going to have much money because when they get to have a little bit more money, they're not going to need to be in the savings groups anymore, and uh, then they'll go on to something else. But these savings groups, even though they are poor, they still like to be able to help others. And. The, um, okay, what you see up there on the screen is basically saying, first the facilitators recruit, other, recruit people to be within the savings groups, then they tell the people the orient is when they're telling the people what is actually how the savings groups will work, then they form their savings group, then every time they have a savings group meeting, the facilitator's job is to do some teaching. 
He spends the first year or year and a half teaching out of our savings group manual, teaching them things like trust and discipline and accountability and transparency and those sorts of things. Wawa well, could tell you about those way better than I can. But uh, they do at every meeting that the facilitator is supposed to be there and doing some educating. Then they get to the end of their cycle. They hand out money to everybody. The group is done and then they decide to reform. If they decide they want to reform, their own decision. We don't tell them what to do, they decide. When they, almost invariably they do, as I understand it, there are groups, some of the original groups in Haiti are still running. And, uh, or uh, some of them have been going for a long time. And sometimes they divide up into two groups, when a new group forms is when new people can go into the group. The, as I understand it, you have to be in the group when it forms for that cycle to be able to be in it. You can't join halfway through. And uh, you can't even leave halfway through. Well, you can leave if you want to, but you don't get your money back until the end of the cycle. And uh, unless, your group, unless you move away and your group has decided that if you move out of the way, out of the way that uh, they will give you some extra money. Or they will give you your money back a little bit quicker than that. Anyway, let me talk just a tiny bit about uh, those are half of our staff. Open Hands is uh, a staff. We don't have very much for North American staff. It is those. And those, that is it for North American staff. Most of them live in America. There are a few that live uh, overseas. We have one couple in Kenya and uh, some, of the, some of these are in, uh, are in uh, Central America also. And the, uh, this is our board. No, let me go back to the staff. Our biggest staff are the facilitators. I think we have uh, somewhere around 200 or 250 native facilitators around the world who are doing the, the teaching in the savings groups. The, uh, this is our board. Marvin Mass, many of you probably know him from uh, Golden Rule Travel. He is Beachy. The next two are, I believe, Weaverland Conference the next two are uh, Mid-Atlantic Conference in Pennsylvania, and uh, then center right is Dwayne Burkholder from Napanee, and then, oops, bottom left, that is a uh, picture of the, our, Amish, uh, our Amish board member, William Fisher. And uh, then the two others on the bottom row, they are mid-Atlantic people from uh, Pennsylvania. Let me show you a few pictures. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with each of these because I never have any time to, uh, but I will show you the pictures because otherwise uh, those who wanted to see pictures will say that they didn't get to see any and they might be upset at me. So you can't be upset at me now because you get to see the pictures. The, uh, and these are just various people, various places around the world who uh, have something to do with savings groups. And uh, we close with this one. What can you do for open hands? You can pray. Pray that we can make contacts with missions whose churches would benefit from savings groups. It seems like about every other church meeting that I am at, someone within the group will come up to me and say, I wonder if we could use savings groups in our mission. I think the best thing that any mission can do that is facing dependency problems within their mission is start up savings groups. Now, when you do, it will go beyond your mission. It will go to everybody in your area. You know when God told us to help the poor? He didn't tell us to help the Anabaptist poor. He didn't tell us to help the poor that are in our mission church. He told us to help the poor. One of the reasons that we are as big as we are to now, we would have always started with Anabaptist missions, but then when the people in the group realized how much it was doing for them and they started telling their friends and their neighbors and relatives, pretty soon we started getting the question, who should we let in the savings groups? 
Do they have to be Anabaptist? Do they have to be Christian? Do they have to be... God said to help the poor. We have Muslim people in our savings groups. We have non-Christian people in our savings groups. Christian Aid Ministries, who also does savings groups through their SALT program in Bangladesh, has savings groups in a Muslim community where the Muslims love the savings group so much that they are willing to let a Christian former Muslim facilitator come in and facilitate their savings groups. And it's just amazing to me what all savings groups are able to do. Have you folks ever heard of the mission in India called Serve India? Is that a familiar mission to you? Okay, I know they are in some Mennonite circles. Anyway, they are a mission that, uh, that we have just recently been working with and they are going to be working with uh, putting some, doing some savings groups also. But pray that people who become part of savings groups can have their relationships restored and can become new creatures in Christ. Second thing you can do is kind of taking the sign up and the learn and the follow all together and say uh, we'll we'll call that um, we'll call that learn. You can learn about open hands. You were here tonight so you learned a little bit. We have a website openhands.org that you can go to and learn a lot more about us. You can sign up and I have a story that I have to tell before I can tell you about the sign-up. And I'm sorry, sorry about taking the extra time, but this was a story that I just uh, that uh, basically happened because of what happened today, or what happened yesterday and today. I'm not exactly sure when it happened. I flew into Chicago Air, uh, Midway Airport last night. I uh, took all my luggage, which included the, some displays that I was planning to have here and a bunch of stuff. <coughs> And I lugged it out to the rental car place and uh, got my rental car and put it all in the rental car and uh, headed down here. I stopped once and got a little something to eat. And then at uh, 9 o'clock in the evening, I pulled in at uh, uh, Steve and Karen is their first name. I don't even remember their last name, but they, uh, they attend the Living Water Church. And uh, he, they are... Uh, uh, in-laws for uh, Tom Troyer. That's how I got connected with them. But anyway, the, uh, I pulled into their house and uh, went into their house and then at about 9.30 I went out and got my stuff and took my stuff into the bedroom where I was staying. And this morning I got up and printed off my notes for my what I was speaking and uh, at 8.30 I went out to my car to get into it and the duffel bag that weighed 48 pounds that had all my display materials in and a bunch of the material that I was going to put on a table and had all my, uh, the, uh, okay, that was taken and also a carry-on bag that I had taken most of the stuff out of it to take into the bedroom, that was taken and in that carry-on bag was the sign-up sheets for uh, signing up for newsletters. Both of those were on the back seat of the car. And when I went in to tell Steve about that, Steve said, did you lock the car? And I said, no. I never lock cars when I think they're in a safe place. And uh, I thought this was as safe as could be. I found out since that there are Amish all around and it probably should be a safe place. But somehow those things disappeared. And uh, nobody has any idea where they went. So I'm going to find a table back here. And here's a piece of paper that you can uh, put your name and address and uh, email on if you would like to have it mailed or emailed to you for the newsletter. And I don't have any former newsletters to give you because they were in that duffel bag. And uh, I don't really have much to hand out to you because somebody and I don't know who, took my display. And uh, I keep praying that it's going to end up uh, back on uh, Stephen Karen's doorstep before I leave. But uh, I don't know. And uh, so that is all gone. So um, I do have some brochures back there, and I should... Uh, 
I should probably get them and have each one of you take one on the way out because the brochure will tell you what our website is and that sort of thing, but uh, I'll try to put them out in a place where you can get one if you want to, if you want to learn more about us. Um, and the third thing you can do is you can give. You say, what do you need money for? You don't put any money into the savings groups, which is right. We do not. We pay the facilitators. When a facilitator is facilitating 10 or more groups, they get uh, pretty well a full-time uh, salary, depending a little bit on which country they're in. It varies from country to country. We pay their transportation for going from savings group to savings group. We, um, we go over to a country at least twice a year to do more training of the facilitators and to encourage them and that sort of thing. We uh, go to uh, train new facilitators and it can get fairly expensive. I feel like our mission does a good job of handling the money that we are given. But when you give to open hands, you're probably not going to get the normal emotional thrill that you get when you give money that's going directly to a poor person to make them so they're not hungry. Because your, mo your money will not do that. The money that you give to open hands will not go in and of itself to a poor person in a material way. It goes in things that they learn and the opportunity that they have to be a part of a savings group so that they can learn that they are a person of value, so that they can have their relationship restored with God and with other people and with themselves. And so because of that, it's harder to get our emotional thrill, but I'm gonna tell you that right up front because I've had people tell me, they have a, how much of my money will go to the poor person? None, in a physical way. But it also won't create any dependency. And so, as you give, the, uh, that's what your money will be going towards. For every $30 you give, that gives one person the opportunity to be a part of a savings group for a year. Our current budget is, uh, is over a million dollars a year. My administrator told me eight or 10 months ago, he said, Paul, in 10 years we could be 10 times as big. Right now, we have all the money that we need. We aren't uh, desperate to pay any salaries. We aren't desperate to pay any of that. We have enough money to pay everything that we're doing. In January, I'm going to Ghana, and we're going to be uh, doing a feasibility study, maybe starting savings groups up in Ghana. In uh, February, we will uh, probably be going into northern Haiti, to a new area of Haiti, and setting up savings groups there. We, uh, in March, there's a possibility we'll be going into Columbia to, uh, in northern Columbia, to set up another area for savings groups. And I've talked to many people who tell me, can we do savings groups with our mission? And so, you know, it could be that uh, 10 years from now, instead of doing 32,000, we'll do uh, 320,000 members. I don't know, but that'll cost a whole lot more money. No. I don't want you to give to open hands unless God is telling you to. I have no doubt in my mind that you are a giving people and that you have done a lot to give to help the poor. And I'm not trying to convince you to give to us. We have all the money that we need right now. But I want you to think a little bit about whether or not your giving is actually what God had in mind when he said, open your hands to the poor. Thank you.